Thank you for coming to listen to me speak. Can you hear me? That sounds good. So um, lovely on my part to be visiting Portland. Such a different experience from everyday life in the center of Manhattan. And I'll uh, see what I can impart. It's a bit challenging to be following Kanye and also Fidel Castro's plug wearing the Adidas <laughs> track suit. But um, we'll see. What I'm going to try and do is just take you through a few of the different places I learned and talk about how my eyes got wider and wider as I encountered new cultures and new materials along the way. My focus shifted. Because I'm a small town girl, I grew up in western Massachusetts in a tiny town where the economics of the family set me right away into sewing my own clothes. It was the 50s. And yeah, I liked all the conversational prints, but I may have lingered more than most when I went to the five and 10 to decide which print I was gonna buy for my next garment. So the 50s were a very tailored, regimented kind of fashion. And um, I set myself a task of sewing one of these regimented shirt dresses, which is the one up on the screen now, something that somehow I kept in the back of my closets all the time from the, my 11-year-old since conception of this. And Caleb always liked this, so recently this dress went on display with me at a show in town. My parents shaped me, of course, my mom, who was constantly knitting and embroidery hated using the sewing machine, and my dad's financial limits put me right to work. So I was looking at this age, about uh, 10 or 11, I was, this is what the real fashion looked like, and I was looking to see what I could do, and always attracted to color. The Shirtwaist dress I made was a real challenge, though. All those straight stripes, all that top stitching, all that ripping and redoing to get to the perfection. So at the beginning, what I was trying to do was copy clothes that were out there that I couldn't afford. But things morphed. After a while of using fabrics, I got interested in working with the skins, which were available. Boston used to be the old center of the shoe trade in the east, so I'd go to jobbers over there and get suede skins and make clothes out of that, and then uh, continued doing that for pocket money during high school. And even during college, I was making custom-made clothes for friends at school with me. This shot is my brave mom who hates traveling airplanes. She's like totally fearful came and joined me up in the mountains in Peru for three weeks. We were at 11,000 feet. She brought a circular knitting needle, and that like really broke the ice. These surrounding ladies didn't even speak much Spanish, but they were knitting all the time. And they had been using five bicycle spokes to make their socks. So when they saw my mom's circular needle, it was like love. And they hung out together for the whole time. It was re really fun. But that's a bit later, jumping ahead. So I finished college. I studied cultural history there. And one of my experiences that was key during that time was getting out of the library, doing a lot of sewing. But one of my friends took a trip to Guatemala, and she came back with handmade huipiles. It was the first time I'd really looked at handmade piece from another culture. And both the technique, that heavy brocaded cotton, and the colors, the Guatemalan colors and what was primarily cotton, really attracted me. However, I was about expressing myself. I'd always wanted to move to a place where 
people looked at clothes. And after college, I went to New York City, to the heart of New York City, the East Village, the youth quake, the rock and roll movement. We were very confident that we were going to change the world with the Vietnam protests and the new music. And I lived there with my fiance until he said, there's just too many sewing machines here, Andrea. And I noticed an empty storefront around the corner. You could just rent that storefront and move all these machines out. It doesn't have to be a business or anything. Just use it like a workspace. So I took that space, and it happened to have a display window right on the street of East 9th Street. So I started trying out some of my crazy ideas and just hanging a garment in the window, and then like people started coming in and asking me about it, and da-da-da. And one of the early visitors was Jimi Hendrix. He came in with these two girls, and he saw my place in the colors of the suede and some snakeskins that I had lying around. And I'd been using them for applique on the suede, but Jimmy said, through these girl interpreters, because he's a really shy guy, didn't want to address me directly at the beginning, but he said, what about doing a whole suit out of snakeskin? So this suit, which Colette is wearing on the left, was the suit I made for Jimmy. It was my very first effort doing a full suit of snakeskins and patching them together, that lower part of the jacket, a uh, whitish part, is a lizard skin. I was really obsessed with the kind of quality, reflective quality of these glazed snake skins. And I collected more and more and more colors and started playing with them, I think. Even then, I was mostly interested in the surface of the garments. I was never very good or, yeah, still not at three-dimensional design, but I liked surfaces. So I collected lots of colors of cobra, and then I also did some work with uh, more exotic skins like the lizard or the boa or pythons, where you could see the natural markings as well as, well, through the colored glaze. And I think we have a few more pictures of items I did. The shop was called Dakota Trans, and I played with suede, with feathers, snake skin, and uh, I liked making these look at me close. So it wasn't just for performers, but some came. And uh, we had pretty good support from Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. The editors would come by or call me, and they'll say, look, we're running a story now on hot pants. you know." So they'd give me like shape ideas. And then I'd produce clothes that they used in editorials. Uh, Yes, this was a pregnancy party, I mean. And Miles Davis was another good conspirator during those years. He was very fashion savvy, and unlike other people who would come in and say, I'd like that, but in red or, you know, general things, Miles was pretty specific, and I realized later when I visited his home and looked at his closet that was about the length of this wall, why he could very easily imagine just the gap that was missing in order clothes for me. He was showing me a camera here, as you can see. I've always been interested in photography. It's another way of vision, another aspect of vision, and I never did it professionally, but I think about things, perhaps from a photographic point of view, how to frame a moment, 
or what is the right angle, or how is the light going to affect the perception? Um, that's what I looked like in um, 1972, maybe, or 71, with my first baby, the brother of Caleb, older brother. And um, I liked wearing the clothes, too. This is uh, myself on the left and Sylvie Vartan in the center, who came in very modestly, and I never realized till weeks later that she was a star. When I visited her in, in party sometime afterwards, I was impressed with the fact that she put on a lot of sunglasses and a low slung hat, and it was only when we were out together and I saw the people thronging around her that, that I realized how famous she was. She never acted any special way with me. She said, come over to the house when you're in France. I went to the house. She had a big white grand piano and some other signs of musical opulence. This was more the kind of work we did at Dakota Transit uh, on a daily basis. I think this was used in a Virginia Slims ad, but <laughs> swayed with swayed with applique, gentle, graceful. This there was part of the market that was liking this kind of stuff. That's East 9th Street back in the day. Hasn't changed much, tenements, but East Village flavor. This lady was married to Miles when I first know, knew him. Her name is Betty Davis, and she's a great singer in her own right. I think there's a movie in the works called Nasty Girl. It's going to be coming out, but she looked great. This was a full-length cape lined with marigold suede, really heavy, and for somebody regal like her, it was perfect. So after a number of years, not too many, three or four years of Dakota Transit, it was pretty intense, I had to admit. And although we'd been closing for a month every summer to give everybody a chance to move out and see new, new sites, um, I was a little bit tired of the pace of New York. And I happened to go down to Peru for one of those summer vacations with my young son. And I just fell in love. It was so different. So. My eyes widened once again. First was New York, being in the thick of very sophisticated dressers. But when I moved to Peru, I realized people there were no less stylish and in, into dressing. So this fellow is a bachelor in town for the weekly market and full of accessories. We know he's a bachelor because of the flowers on his hat and just an incredible number of baubles. I think there may be a few other shots later on showing more of the accessories, but both the men and the women, when they were advertising this themselves as ready for marriage, did get dressed up. And if you can imagine all this intensity of color against a very, very brown landscape, we're up Above the tree line here, there's a little bit of ichu, which is yellowy grass. But almost all the color comes from the people. So they really stand out. And that's about what I was looking like in my early years in Peru. So after this first vacation, I just, it was passion. I closed Dakota Transit and moved to Peru with this young boy. And I just started looking around. I didn't speak any Spanish. I went to the markets one day, two days. And the third day in Cusco, obviously I hadn't learned Spanish by then, I jumped on a bus 
behind a guy who just had a phenomenal poncho. And that was the way I started visiting villages, following people out of town. It was quite effective. <laughs> this sweater, which you can't see very well, is one that my mom actually did when she came down. She was inspired by the motifs of the knitters around. So she took those ideas back and grafted out and actually produced a sweater. And then that was a very big hit because people knew I was pretty committed to their culture when they saw it reflected with a hand knit sweater from the outside. And so it went. I was fascinated by talking with these people and looking at the way they worked. They were pretty curious about me and my kids and why would I be leaving hot water and living as their neighbors trudging to the market and trudging and trudging. And they have lungs and chests that were three times wider than me. They were running up mountains and dancing. And, you know, I was like, oh, can I go? Backstrap loom weaving was something I saw in Peru for the first time. Well, it was just, everything was new. I started looking at fibers, which I hadn't examined well. They use alpaca and wool. I'd been looking at things dyed uh, mostly on cotton. So that was part of the learning experience. The whole t cycle of time was something I had to get used to. Their lives were very well marked by agriculture or the seasons for the animals. So it was work, work, work. The ladies went to church on Sundays, and men went drinking. And then there were fiestas to break this up, mostly on the Catholic holidays. The old people, both men and women, who couldn't go out to the fields or follow the animals were given the job of caring for the house. And they would do small weavings. This is called a watana. It's basically a little narrow strap that could be used, but they were the, the housekeepers. And you can notice on that lady's sleeve that her blouse is still in a very old style. It's a colonial style blouse with big sleeves and buttons. So their clothes were a mix of East and, and West. West being the Spanish tradition this very serious looking fellow from Cusco. So most of the days were agricultural and their costumes were wool and the motifs were geometric, but things would really break out on the fiesta days. The imagery switched from geometric to picturesque and uh, we had local dances, many local dances. This is a costume in a town that I visited many times for the woven mantas, but they insisted that I come for the fiestas so I could see what, how, what they'd look like at a different moment, and these were extraordinary costumes. These are close-ups of other dance costumes, bibs, embroidered by men, worn by men. It's a bib down the back. But the imagery was really telling. It's kind of a mixed society. They are very few people can read, but they had some references available, printed references, mainly calendars, printed calendars, or comic books. So from this, they drew images and uh, yeah, they're quite, quite dramatic. This fellow is called Jorge Chavez. And in Peru, when you have a turtleneck collar like that, it's called the Jorge Chavez. He was an early aviator. And one of the few folk heroes that I saw in the imagery who was not military man, but well beloved. So another place where I spent time was China. When I left Peru 
at the beginning of the unrest of the Shining Path. Um, I did it in a big hurry, and I'd been a little bit nervous being in that area at the beginning of the Civil War. So I had the idea that I wanted to go to a very safe, boring place. That was London. I moved the family to London and spent some time there. The British Museum was very interested by this collecting I've been doing in Peru, and I spent about six months with a grad student documenting. Uh, they bought a collection of 400 pieces, including many textiles, mostly textiles, but some masks and some toys. And then I was in London, and it was nice vantage point to take a little worldwide look because after being up close for all those years in Peru studying just one culture, here I was in a city that offered very open access to museum collections, to libraries, and to professors at places like SOAS. And yeah, it was it was good to be positioned there and take a little worldwide look and make little trips out from London. So I traveled to some new countries I hadn't visited yet in Asia. And then at that point in the early 1980s, I heard from fellow travelers that China was beginning to open up to independent travelers. What a gold mine. We just couldn't imagine what was in China and been closed for so many years. So I made a couple of trips out to China, again looking for areas of minority costume. And then I decided it was just too far. So for one year with Caleb, who was five, and Shad, who was 12, we traipsed around China for a whole year. It was just fascinating. And not without its challenges. Um, the rules at that time allowed independent foreign travelers like ourselves access to only 12 cities in the whole of China. And they were big cities, and they really weren't the place that I wanted to be to be looking at handmade, indigenous, local, traditional things. So we often had to walk out of town, go to that city, but then walk out of town for 10 or 15 kilometers to get to the villages. And there was always a little bit of tension. If we were, if we tried to buy a bus ticket, or much less go with a government official, the minority people, as we called them, would have just like totally clammed up. So we had to be accessible and arrive there on our, on our own. The official policy, I think, at that time regarding these minority people was that they should become more Chinese. They should put on the khaki uniform. They should learn Mandarin. They should blend in. And in fact, it was quite a while later maybe a decade or so, that the government swung again and said, oh no, put on your dance costumes and come out and entertain the tourists. It'll be good, yeah. But at the beginning, when I met people, they had their own costumes hidden away under the bed. So it was a little bit hard to get them. I mean, once again, I don't really have a language option here. Some of those men are educated people here and there surely spoke Mandarin, but I didn't. But I learned a little pidgin Mandarin. It was mostly the mutual curiosity. If we sat down with, with the kids in the middle of the plaza and they just played with their toys for a few hours and we just took a while they would come creeping up because they couldn't resist seeing these blonde kids. You know, it was just a phenomenon. And then we liked them too. So we were all like looking at each other. Very nice. So this costume we're looking at right here is a costume of 
Miao people in a town called Anshun, province of Guizhou. Um, they do phenomenal embroidery. And I wanted to take a look with you just at a very small group of pieces that I collected. When I first came to this place, I said, oh, they're all wearing the same thing. It's got three bars, three columns on each side. It's got a grid pattern in the middle. But then I began to look more closely, and I realized how these patterns varied. So there you have a situation where you, it's traditional. It's obviously, it's got to be in red, it's got to be on indigo, uh, hand, hand woven cloth, but look at these variations between it. So I tried to gather information and how are things changing? It's traditional, but what's changing? Because they, like everybody else, said, oh, no, I wouldn't wear that. You know, that's my grandmother's style. Okay, what was the difference? Very slight. In the case of these people, it was uh, color change. The very oldest people, grandmother age, when I was there, were embroidering with a, a very dark red was the color. The 40-year-old women were using a color more like scarlet. And the very young kids, I didn't include pictures here, but they were using a shocking pink. So the layout stayed the same, but they did this amazing variation of images. And it's all counted thread embroidery, just under a tree, embroidering during, in their spare time. And when I showed these to Jack Leonard Larson, he said right away, oh, this is a design collection. And then I said, oh yeah, so it is, you know. It's like, it's a different speed. It's not the wide open possibilities that we have in Portland or Paris. But they had some choices to make and they were competitive with each other. Everybody wanted the best work. These are some musicians in the neighborhood. Everyone looked at us, yeah. It was, was hard to avoid that. This actually is from an island in, called Hainandao in the far south of China. It fascinated me when we arrived in Hainandao. It was, for one thing, an island, which meant it had boundaries. China was overwhelmingly complex. Even among the 4% of the population that was minority, there were bunches of different traditions, different styles of dressing. And I thought it would never, in 10 lifetimes, get to the bottom of explaining the whole country. But Hainan was bounded. And the lady you saw with her tattooed legs was interesting to me. She's probably one of the last people to be tattooed. I mean, her, her age group, uh, because at the moment of independence, 48 or so, they made it, the government made it pretty clear that tattooing was barbaric and they wanted this stopped. But these older women were tattooed on their forearms, their legs, and the tattoos complemented the designs that they wore on their clothes. So whatever was going to be bare skin was tattooed, but the designs were related to the motifs on the clothes. I mean, very sophisticated. This is back in Guizhou, some different styles of meow dressers a big wrapped head, and uh, baby carriers were one of the logical places that they wanted to embellish. This is all cross-stitch embroidery from Wa Miao, a different tribe or a different group, subgroup. I can't tell you too much 
ethnographically since I never learned to read Mandarin and just collected stories on the fly. This is over back down in the island of Hainandao. It's a different style of weaving, so the tension is just between the feet and the strap, which goes around the weaver's back. I hadn't experienced that in other countries, so I was pretty impressed. And we stayed for that year in China. It was fabulous, 83, 84. But during that time, my parents were sort of saying, you know, really the kids should go to school. You know, it's nice that you had this little experience. Put the kids in school. And I said, okay, I'm not done with China by any means. I'll go and live in Japan. It's close by. I can just hop back and forth all the time. So Japan was the next day. We arrived in 84. And personally, I'd always loved the Japanese aesthetic, but from afar, what I could see in the cities, you know, in New York, here and there, in magazines. I hadn't been before in a culture that was very, or a textile culture, that was very silk-based. So I went with wide open eyes to Japan. That's what I look like. That's what Japan looked like. I mean, I wasn't very intrigued by Tokyo. I was constantly going out, rustling up old garments, and then putting them before people saying, what is this? Where was it made? In Japan, differently from China or Peru, I was buying samples, not directly from the people who had made them. So it was a little bit different style of investigation. What I typically did was, and I've always done this in any country, I bought a piece that really attracted me emotionally, visually. That was the first criterion. Later came question, questioning. So I didn't start out with a concept that I want to learn everything about Kasuri Ikat or everything about this or that. It was piece by piece. In Japan, I did buy some kimono and haori garments, but I also bought a lot of swatches because it was kind of a critical moment there. People were no longer wearing kimono on a daily basis. This was the mid-'80s. Japan was rich. They saw themselves as king of the economic pinnacle, which had good and bad effects on our stay there. For machines, it couldn't have been better. People were always giving us stuff. Someone even gave us a car because everybody wanted the very latest and they felt sorry for these foreigners and maybe they thought we wouldn't notice that it wasn't the very latest model so we didn't have to be ashamed. But anyway, we got TVs and rice cookers and furniture and, uh, yeah, lots of stuff given to us. And as in other places, people reacted. They were, they were quite helpful with my questions about the textiles. I would say, as a country, more people can talk about textiles. In America, or in Europe, you know, maybe one in a thousand people is interested in textiles. But in Japan, textiles are, are a real subject, an everyday subject. So I collected bits and pieces, and then I showed them to people, saying, what is it? When was it used? And there were still a lot of grandmothers who had closets full, or in that case, storage shelves full of kimono, and they were really happy to talk to me. I always had to have a translator, but I learned maybe a few hundred color words and other uh, specific textile words. There was one story. I mean, it just blew my mind, all this textile ability that they had in refinement in Japan. But there was one story I just couldn't swallow. 
And it had to do with this particular type of still silk textile that you see in front of us. This is a style that was called Oshima. And it referred to an island, Oshima Island, located between the main land of Kyushu and Okinawa. It's way out there. They told me that these textiles were created by being bound, both the weft and the warp, being bound off and buried in mud, iron-laden mud, to create this beautiful brown dye. And I just couldn't believe that there was that much labor. So with a journalist friend, we went down to Oshima, and she had already arranged for visits to the mills, and I got to see this being made. What they did was bind off the warp and weft separately. They did the binding. It, sorry, it shouldn't be called binding. It's resisting. They'd put a thick thread through that would resist some of the areas. Then they'd bury the threads. Then they'd unwrap these threads. Then they'd dry them, stretch them out. And then finally they'd weave them, perfectly lining up so that these crosses and other elements came to life. And so finally I had proof. They were still doing it. And Oshima was a style that was developed. I think at one point Oshima Island used to send these beautiful textiles as tribute payments instead of taxes. But inevitably, you know, everybody loved them. Everybody wanted them. So Kagoshima and Kyushu started reproducing them. And they were done in other parts of the country. But when you're there in front of the color, you can see which ones are the natural dyes, and they're just gorgeous. I brought a few pictures from my last research trip to Japan, which was just a few years ago. I should tell you that after the three years in Japan, I did not feel like I knew things well enough. So for the last 25 or 30 years, I've continued to go to Japan. One more question answered, one more place visited. The very last trip I did was up to the north end of Honshu Island to Aomori and Akita and Niigata. And they were so happy to see me. It was the height of festival season. There were quite a few domestic visitors, but very few foreigners up in that area. And they said, well, you know, from far away, far away places, they heard about Fukushima. They think the whole of the north is contaminated, so no one's coming to our area either. How nice that you've come. And they showed me around. And this is pretty interesting area culturally. They get heavy snows, and their main occupation is rice and sake making. But the winters are, are harsh. When I went to the Museum of Folk art and folk tools. There were loads of sleds and old photographs of people moving the logs by sled. They're pretty well snowed in. So they developed a craft of using the rice straw. And that picture of boots is made of straw. They make every, made everything out of straw. So that was a nice compliment. And the clothes in the area are very much uh, cotton, indigo dyed cotton kasuri. And they developed some nice styles of the previous photos. You can see this, this was in a museum. So gloves of straw, hats of straw with the indigo and white, a little bit of red. These are called in Japan kind of country style clothes. These were worn by farmers. Cotton was cheap, much cheaper than silk. They didn't really have access to silk up there in the north. And this was a guy very generously came in to show me the preparation of rami.
They call it they call it asa in Japan. It's it's like a linen fiber. It comes from the stalk of the plant. Very laborious uh, scraping. And um, yes, I saw a few museum curators. Couldn't resist bringing in a garden picture because for me the landscape was was part of it. You know, outside of Tokyo, Tokyo and a few other population s centers that we most often see pictures from are very densely populated. But the whole rest of the country is mountainous and uh, quite beautiful. You guys look at uniforms sometimes. These are uniforms during a fiesta of the children and young people who were carrying the uh, floats through the center of town. And this is what is happening nowadays. This is just a few years ago. Kimonos have gone. They continue to be worn in the summer. They're called yukatas. They're printed on cotton, pretty cheap. And young girls on their cell phones are wearing yukatas, and, you know, life goes on. After living in Japan for three years and collecting quite a bit of material. I wanted to be in a country where I didn't need a work visa. And I moved back to New York City. And uh, yeah, it was quite a challenge coming here with a family who'd never lived in America. But my collections of ethnic textiles were of interest to my friends who were designers. And they said things like, no, we don't want to learn how to fold a kimono, but if you have a swatch, that would work for us. So I started a new business at Union Square in New York called Textile Documents, and that business was about collecting and showing swatches and artwork from other countries or from uh, commercial mills, but vintage or antique textiles from Europe and America as inspiration for new work. And we showed in the studio in Union Square. We even came to Portland occasionally, traveled all around with our suitcases and trying to make just the right pick. And we did design shows where we uh, sat with other studios creating new artwork. We did shows in New York and also Paris. This is a picture of Dries Van Noten with his assistant looking at stuff at our table. I learned the loads during this textile documents phase and I did it for about 25 years. One thing I learned to do was try and particularly see through the eyes of the clients. People like you who might come and say, we want to do something with these colors, or we want to do something that's art deco, or we want to do something that feels like Africa. I mean, to take this verbal input and try and imagine what the client was seeing was a big exercise for us. And uh, this is a show booth that we did for something or other when I was trying to project large designs might have been my theme at that moment. And um, a couple of cards that we did. The studio moved to a larger space on Broadway. Great light, loved being there. But there were so many designs to choose from. And as you probably find, your eyes get tired. So a lot of it was editing, what to show a client, what to pull out, what did they need, what could I add, and um, it was good, good times. That's my son Caleb and my friend uh, decorating. I like that. They're standing on top of a flat file, by the way, which makes it all the more intriguing. But we pulled stuff that we liked in People would browse what we had on the walls, what we had in the suitcase. But it was very physical and limiting in some ways, which is why I'm so excited about what Caleb has built with this collection. 
at a certain point, he said, Mom, too old-fashioned. Got to get with the times. Virtual. New ways of looking at things. And that was in 2009 that we moved the whole 40,000-piece collection to its new home here in Portland, where it's known as Textile Hive. And for those of you who haven't visited yet, it's a good place to visit. And you can work in a much better way now because you can begin by looking at the virtual pictures. You can ask for anything. You can ask for cats. You can ask for ecots. You can ask for shibori. You can ask for a technique, for a fiber, for a dateline. And you can assemble all those pictures virtually and then easy to go to and see them physically. So I'm very excited. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that you guys have subscribed. And I would urge you to use it now that you have the subscription and ask us questions and we'll all grow together. What I've been doing lately Yes, um, I've been ill for a while, but I was doing research with my collections up to that time. I had things photographed and were researching some pieces that I bought here and there that I didn't get directly from homes, but bought from dealers. And um, at the end of it all, I like dressing. So I was invited for a party two weeks ago and party, a birthday party. They couldn't attend. Everybody was supposed to be dressed as an alien. I felt bad that I couldn't go. So my friends said, well, let's just do the costume and send the photos. So uh, yeah, that's what I looked like a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I'm still into dressing and having fun. So I'd like to hear from you any possible omissions things that you might be interested to ask. Watching from around the world because we wanted to film this moment, so I encourage you to ask questions. I know we're close on time. If anyone needs to go, I just ask that you go out the back. But yeah, question over here. Caleb, are you going to join me? <laughs> Hi. On, uh, oh, first just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and your collection. It's very gracious of you. Uh, I'm actually curious if you have any theories, you know, since you've traveled the world and you've experienced these really intimate connections that other cultures have with textiles. Um, I'm curious if you have any theories of, of why in our American culture we've kind of lost that and it's almost become this, uh, you know, kind of hobbyist, kind of less a, a much less intimate um, connection that we have here in the United States with textiles in general. And um, I'm just curious if you have any theories of, of why that's happened or... Well, I like what's happening, even though you call it a hobbyist thing, that people are putting their hands back on materials. Because I think once you've done it, you appreciate more what went into it. So. We were just talking a couple of minutes ago about where people are culturally, and maybe they're getting tired of the slick packaged virtual and wanting to feel the texture and the warmth and the personal again. But I can't say I have an overall theory, but I sense this, that Americans now are reaching back, reaching back for history, interested in vintage, going a bit beyond the surface of just calling it a vintage, but where is it actually from? I think we have a curiosity about ties to the past, and now that we have this ability to research virtually, we may find it enriching. Come on. I know there's more questions. I have questions. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Josh, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a question. You mentioned that um, you were buying 
uh, a lot of textiles from dealers later on, and with the intimate time that you've spent in some of those places like Peru, China, Japan, is the collection now more global? And um, a lot of the pieces you maybe have within the 40,000 have been purchased through dealers to just bring in like Africa and uh, other continents and places that you didn't personally get to spend so much time in. That's a very good, good question. The textile hive collection was augmented when I moved back to the States. It was clearly a big hole that I didn't have vintage American and European textiles. So I tried to fill that in because I was a little embarrassed. I went to the um, D&D building early on, and they'd asked me to be, bring traditional florals, and I showed up with a lot of cherry blossoms, and they, like, fell off their chairs laughing. And so, you know, they said, look, Andrea, you know, it's roses. You know, so from there, I tried to fill in that gap, but I haven't bought many ethnographic textiles from dealers. I wish I could c collect in Africa. I'd like to augment the textile hive in my own holdings with things from other places. But I bought things, for example, in Paris, I'd buy occasionally Moroccan textiles, you know, just one piece at a time. But without, just more for what they look like, and only now am I researching Oh, this came from Fez, and it was made in blah, blah, blah. But there are lots of holes. Textile Hive is not complete, frankly. It has clothes from 50 countries, though. I mean, cloth. So it's, um, it's on its way. Um, you work with so many people, and more and more all the time now through the digitization. Is there a, uh, a, a group or a partnership that you feel particularly proud of that we should look at as an example of how we might use Textile Hive? Hmm. Caleb. <laughs> uh, so Textile Hive is relatively new. We just launched it a year ago, and... Um, you know, ultimately, when I started my project, um, I was trying to home, find a home for the physical collection, and people um, responded to seeing it digitally, but no one wanted to take on the physical collection, and so I wasn't really ready to split it up, and uh, I always thought the physical collection was really kind of important, and so we're kind of as we speak, defining our role. Um, traditionally, we are kind of just an anonymous resource where fashion de designers would come, um, but we would, no one would ever know where the reference was from. And um, I think uh, we've launched some educational initiatives and schools are using the collection. And so last fall, the Art Institute, um, we did a joint exhibition where um, uh, kind of uh, the historical references were placed uh, along with the students, so that was something I was really proud of. You know, a lot of people outside Portland uh, may never see it, but I think that's kind of um, uh, the way I see things moving forward in terms of just acknowledging, and even if it's just the color or the layout, just like seeing the connection so people have a, um, a better idea of uh, both the past and, you know, kind of where things are going, and, um, you know, I think... Um, consumers now or people, you know, when I'm shopping, I really want to know kind of what the process was like so it's not um, all of a sudden I just see something, you know, and maybe I like it, but if I know the story of where it came from, what the designer's decisions were, what they were trying to achieve, it makes it uh, a lot more powerful for me. Any other questions or curiosities? Um, one thing I just want to acknowledge as well, it's super honor to have both of you with us. When the team went and saw the library, it is a living space from all cultures, from all time. So you saw a snapshot of the physical space and how amazing it is that it is one collection. You can imagine how many museums would like to come in and pull it apart. Um, and it is digital as well. So the fact that 
these two have bridged each other's right and left brain as a family is quite remarkable. Um, but we were so curious to meet you and to hear about what the world has been like through your eyes because we would take out the swatches and you can see the color and where it's from in the world and the process of it. Um, it's absolutely profound and it's right here in town and we have a membership so it's an absolute honor to get to hear about the curiosities of how you've traveled the world and how you've preserved the past um, and bridged it with the thank future. You so so much thank for you inviting so, me. so much. Great. Um, and a small group of us will be meeting in my office um, on the second floor in the yellow building. So if any of you want to come and have a bit more of an intimate conversation, you're welcome to do that. But thank you, Caleb, and thank you, Andrea, so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.